Okay, so um, back to the story of modules again. So um, we're in chapter 10. Um, I've done it in foot. Third edition. And um, so last time we basically just gave the definition of an R module, right? And um, we looked at the example. The last example we were looking at was the um, the um, FX module. Corresponding to uh, a linear transformation. which is, you know, mapping from vector space to a vector space, right? And let's see here. So the rule was simply this. If we have polynomial f of x, right, and we want to act on the uh, linear transformation t, well, that gives us, um, oh, excuse me, we want to act on, um, do, 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 do. I've lost my way. I'm trying to remember what my, my set was. Uh, D is a vector space over F, T is linear um, Make V into, so V the set, the set um, FX module is, so just to be clear, the set on which we're defining in our action is the vector space. And the ring on which, with, with which we're acting is the polynomial ring, right? So to make sense of a polynomial, um, so rather, sorry, my bad. So the polynomial acting on the vector v is the polynomial of the transformation acting on, on the v. Now these parentheses I just put in are sometimes omitted, you know. So here, so if f of x is like a0 plus a1x plus a n x to the n, then f of t means a0 times the identity on v, right, plus a1 t, a n t to the n, where powers of an operator are defined in terms of uh, composition, right? Like, for example, t squared acting on v, what's that mean? That means t of tv, right? Okay. And let's see here, what was a, what was a sub-module? Remember? Yeah, submodule of M, submodule of M equals to V would be a subspace in this case, right? It's an additive subgroup of V. We'll say a subspace W, right? Um, on which um, W is naturally an FX module. Um, defined by T. So what that means, right, is that when we take F of X and we act on, you know, W, little w for w in, in the big w, right? That's going to be what? That's going to be f of t, right? And that's going to act on what? It's going to act on w, right? So in order for this to be a, in order for a subspace to be a 
correspond to a submodule, it's a very special kind of subspace, right? Because we have to have the condition that this is an element of W again. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a uh, we wouldn't have that the the, um, the module action naturally restricts to the sub the subgroup additive subgroup W of of, of V. But thankfully, there's a lemma. It's not as scary as it looks because actually if T of W is an element of W for all W and W, in other words, you have that T of the subspace W is a subspace of W again, subset of W. It is a subspace as it happens because that's the range that's the image of a subspace, which is a subspace. We know that from linear algebra. But anyway, if that condition is met, then f of t um, acting on w, you know, is an element of w for all f of x in f of x. Because if you think about it, what happens when you think about higher powers of t, like I'll just show you a sample calculation just to think through it, you know, like t, let's just look at t cubed to be specific. t cubed of w would be what? This would be t of t of t of w. That's what that means, right? But if we know that T maps W to W, then T of W is just W prime, where W prime is, again, some element of the subspace W, right? So we've got T of T of W prime, which is, well, T of W prime prime, let's say, because this is, again, an element of W using the fact that W is what's called an invariant subspace of T. But then, once more, using that uh, T, W is in a very subspace, we have that this is, is itself an element of W, right? And so I've showed you how to do it for the third power, but you can just as well do it for an arbitrary power. And then, because of linearity, we can get it for a polynomial, any polynomial. So, definition. So we have a couple of different goals going forward in here. Um, let me just state those for a second. So one of our goals is just to gain uh, uh, an introductory understanding of what is a module and like what can we say about modules. All right, so just basic module theory. Then our other goal is to understand how that um, interlaces with our theory of vector spaces in linear algebra. Like how is it different? How is it the same? What can we learn about vector spaces from this study? Um, and then, of course, the other side of things, so that's kind of chapter 11. But it's a little bit, a little bit twisted because really chapter 12, which is chapter 12 is modules over a PID, which is a principal ideal domain. So the theory of modules over a principal ideal domain is most beautiful. There are classification theorems there. Like if you have a module over a PID, you can say up to isomorphism what it looks like. All right, so chapter 10, we're going to talk about what we mean by isomorphism of modules, which is similar to isomorphism of vector spaces, but there are some surprises. Um, so that's like, so this is the, this is the rub, is to really understand the more technical results in chapter 11, you need the machine that's in chapter 12. So chapter 11 is kind of a throwaway chapter. It's just kind of like, here's, uh, here's vector spaces in 20 minutes, you know. Um, so... Um, like, if I was to write the book, I would probably have, like, chapter 10 like it is. And it wouldn't be as awesome as theirs, of course. But, and then, like, chapter 12 would be chapter 11. And then chapter 13 would be, okay, now let's go back to vector spaces and see, like... But it would be kind of boring, too, because it would just be like, oh, yeah, that's linear algebra. So that is... Those are the um, things I'm wrestling with and how to present the material, right? 
But the thing is, once we're done with chapter 10, we're going to flip actually over here to this book, Manifolds, Tensors, and Forms. And in here, there is a really cool, like, 10-page presentation of homology and co like the, the calculation of um, a particular module that describes the shape of space. So we'll be able to see like how to calculate the cohomology groups. I mean the homology groups rather of like a sphere. So we'll do that. It takes me about two hours to do that justice. But to best understand that, we should finish chapter 10 first. So that'll have to be after the break. Um, okay, so definition. So what I'm doing right now sort of feeds into the question of how does modules better help us to understand, how, how, does, mod, how does modules help us to understand vector space ideas better? And so this is kind of the fundamental example for that, for that question. But this is the definition. So if um, T is a linear transformation from V to V, and W is a subspace of V with T of W, subset of W, then W is an invariant. Well, I should be more specific. What kind of invariant? The invariance has nothing to do with V so much as it has to do with T. So it's a T invariant. It's a T invariant subspace. So another way to look at this is if you're given, given an FX module induced by T, the um, submodules are in one-to-one -one correspondence with T invariant subspaces of V. So if we can understand the general theory of modules, and, and the general theory of modules gives us insight as to what the possible structure of modules are, that then in turn gives us insight as to what the possible T invariant subspaces of a linear transformation are. So anyway, this arrow goes both ways. The insight flows both directions, all right? Now, um, Summit and Foote calls these T-stable subspaces of V. Um, that makes sense too, right? We call it a stable subspace that fixes it to itself. Um, okay, so proposition one, submodule criterion. State that. So, what's the submodule criterion? Let R be a ring in M. M and R module. Right. A subset. N of M, all right, is a submodule of M if and only if the following two conditions meet are met. Number one, N is non, not the empty set. <laughs> two, um, X plus Ry is an element of N for all X and Y in N and R in R. So you can you can recognize this, right? This this look does this look familiar? If you think about like linear algebra, what does it remind you of? Um, the, that, that, what's it called? The scalar and, scalar and addition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
yeah, it says addition and scalar multiplication in one test. Yeah, so I, I would say some people would call this the two-step subspace test, right? But the difference is that this is the module action, r times y, it's not scalar multiplication. Are all the m's same? Like, is that m, that m, that m? Yeah, they're all the same. I should put my feet. Sorry, I put the shoes back on. There we go. It's better. Um, I guess I should give my n. There, I'll decorate my n's. Is that better? Now they're fancy. Fun. All right, let me stop. Um, so <laughs> this is the, the submodule test, all right? And um, all right, so what's next? Then definition. All right, let R be a commutative ring with identity. All right, commutative ring with identity and R algebra, or a algebra as I like to call it, but my students do not. A algebra is a ring A A with an identity together with a ring homomorphism. homomorphism C mapping R to A all right such that what um, with so phi of 1 in the ring maps to 1 in, in, in the algebra all right so A is for algebra here, such that F of R, oh sorry, he used F on me. I'll use this is I'll go letter F, there we go. F. Such that F of R is contained in the center of A. What does that mean, center of A? So that means that things in F of R commute with the entire algebra, right? So, you know, my undergraduate research project is pretty much all about real algebras. And you notice that, like, so, like, that, that's one of the, well, one of the small difficulties of the undergraduate research I do is it doesn't really quite fit into the standard, you know, abstract algebra we cover in um, you know the usual curriculum they're not groups right a group an algebra is not a group I mean it's a ring right but how much time do you spend talking about rings <laughs> so that's the anyway not usually fields either um, let's see here so for example you know if you take A equal to the complex numbers, right, is, is A a real algebra, right? Where, what, would, what would F be? F of X is just equal to what? X plus I times zero, right? That gives you uh, homomorphism from R 
to the complexes such that the f of r, well, it's not hard to be contained in the center of the complex numbers, is it? <laughs> is the center the same way we think about it in groups? It is, yeah, it is the same ideas in groups. Let me, let me give you one that's a little bit less, um, you know. Um, so you could look at A. Mm -hmm. well, I was just thinking, like, if we define the center as a group, is that stuff that commutes with everything? Yes, the stuff that commutes with everything, so right. If it's a ring, isn't it all, oh, wait, no, no, it's only for two edges. Mm. Let's see here. Of course, he's got a bunch of examples. Um, any ring with identity is a Z algebra. Um, for any ring with identity, our a subring of the center of A continuing identity is in our algebra. Um, for example, the polynomial ring R of X is in our algebra. Poly, polynomial ring in any number of variables is in our algebra. The group ring, RG, for a finite group is in our algebra. Um, let's see here. So he's got some nice examples written down here on page 343. Um, let me see if I can come up with a, a little bit more exotic example. How about... Um, If I can do it, let's let A be um, like two by two real matrices, you know? Two by two real matrices. Um, so this has, you know, matrix addition and scalar multiplication, right? Like a constant times A, B, C, D, ooh. Bad, bad choice of letters. A constant times, you know, so that defines the, the, the module action. See, scalar multiplication of two by two matrices. This makes, this is an R module. Right, because it's a it's a vector space, really. Right. Um, let's see here. So to, to 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 explain why A is also in R algebra, I need to pr pr provide what I need to provide. Um, well, it's, first of all, A's got to be a ring, right? Is this a ring? Is that see. Th well, no, no, no. Um, what I'm saying is a vector space is not necessarily a, um, a ring, right? A ring has an addition and a multiplication. Like that, you, you, don't, oh, don't, yeah, you don't, don't, don't look past this. This says that there's a way of multiplying things in A, right? So what's the multiplication in A here? It's just, no, 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 easier than that. So if, you know, if you have, um, let's say, big X and big Y, in A, then x, y, the ijth element of it is the sum k equals 1 to 2 of x, i, k, y, k, j. In other words, matrix multiplication. So that's the formula for matrix multiplication. Um, The dot products of the columns, yeah. So, but here, of course, note, this is a more interesting example than example one because, of course, xy is not e necessarily equal to yx, right? Like, you, you, you don't have to have, it's not a commutating, it's not a commutative, it's a commutative algebra. I mean, it's not a commutative ring. It does have identity, right? What's the identity? Um, one, zero, zero, one. Yeah, 1001, zero, zero, one, great. So to, 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 to show that A is in R algebra, I have to provide a homomorphism, right, to the center of this algebra. What is the center of two by two matrices, right? What is the center 
of R2 by 2 with respect to matrix multiplication. It is stuff with diagonal. It is actually that. You can prove that this is a homework exercise. <laughs> it is lambda. I'm, I'm not sure I made it a homework exercise. I'm saying it could be one. But it is lambda times 1, 0, 0, 1. Um, well, I'm trying to remember. You might be able to have different numbers on those. I'm trying to remember. Hmm. See, now I'm a little fuzzy. I think it's just scalar multiples of the identity. I, yeah. Well, here, here's a question. If I had 2, 0, 0, 3, does that commute with all other matrices? So if I have this, no. is this automatically equal to, it's because if it's not, then I, I, I know I remembered right. So this is um, 2a, 2c, 3b, 3d. Is that equal to you know, 2a, 2b, 3c, 3d? No. No, it's not, right? So. I might have I might have done those backwards, but anyway, one is like this. So this is that. This is that. Okay. If you're wondering. Yeah. Anyway, the point is they're not equal, so no, 2, 0, 0, 3 cannot be in the center. Right? Because you can pick a, ba a matrix A, B, C, D, which it does not commute with. All right, fine. So that's what the center of our 2 by 2 is. So what's the homomorphism? From the real numbers to two by two. Um, you just take a real number and then you, so you take it from R to R across two by two, and it takes an X to an X times identity. Yeah, X times times identity, right, exactly. And that that's the homomorphism. Which means it's additive and multiplicative. So yes, indeed, two by two matrices form a real Algebra in the technical sense defined here, yeah. And um, does it form a, a complex algebra? Well, no, it doesn't, right? It's not a complex algebra. You can, you can, you can find a subset of two by two matrices which form a complex algebra, which is isomorphic to the complex numbers, right? Like if you take B, or let's say M. equal to the set of things of the form A, B, A minus B, B, A, like that, yeah? Such that A and B are real numbers. Then you can prove that this subset M, right? You can prove that this subset M is closed. This is closed under matrix addition and matrix multiplication, right? It's closed under matrix addition and, and matrix multiplication. And, um, and also, M is commutative, right? So this is actually a, so this is interesting. You're like, wait a minute, I thought you said that the matrices which are commutative and the two by two matrices were just scalar multiples of the identity. Well, be careful. I'm saying these are the matrices which commute with everything, right? Which is not to say that you can't pick other subsets of two by two matrices which commute among themselves. Yeah. So this commutes within itself, right? It's, it's weird to think that like the complex matrices, it's, the, the complex numbers are a subset of R2 plus B. Mm. Nevertheless, this is a, you know, a, an algebra with respect to um, matrix multiplication, addition, you know. And um, the homomorphism in this case is just this guy. In fact, it's an isomorphism because this is the regular representation of the complex numbers as a matrix algebra.
I know. It's, I mean, I don't think of complex numbers as two by two matrices either. But of course, this is not the only algebra which is possible in the complex number or in the two by two matrices, right? If I just erase this minus <coughs> here and erase it here, then this two by two matrix algebra is not isomorphic to the complex number. It's it's the hyperbolic numbers, and the hyperbolic numbers are another example of an R algebra. All of my associative algebras are real algebras like this. Okay, anyway. Um, another kind of very greedy example is just given by um, endomorphisms. I should mention that example here. Let me erase, Let me erase all this, okay. Um, And of course, I did for two by two, right? But you could do what we were just doing for n by n, and um, you could. Uh, I mean, you you can. Anyway, you could do a lot. I'll just I'll leave it at that. Three. If I look at um, a equal to what are called endomorphisms. Um, I keep with the real numbers for the moment, right? Um, but if you, well, maybe I should be a little bit greedier. Um, well, for now, this and more. So, so what I'm, these are linear transformations from V to V, is another notation you might see, you know. Linear transformations from V to V. Then. Um, if you have two such things, right? If you have T and S in this thing, then certainly the linear, uh, the sum of linear transformations is a linear transformation, right? Because you know the sum of linear transformations is a, I'm repeating myself a linear transformation, <laughs> but also the composite of two linear transformations is a linear transformation, right? So A is a ring with respect to the addition and composition of maps. It's a ring, right? And I would argue, in fact, that it's an R algebra. Because what's the homomorphism? By the way, you can show that the center, the center of A is of form Lambda <laughs> times the identity on V. And that does that does take that that is um, the first time you work that out. It will require some effort on your part to really come to terms with this that the linear transformations, which commute with all other linear transformations under composition, they're just scalar multiples of the identity. And that's all that's possible. Um, so like one proof of that is to pick a basis. And I, I am thinking V is a finite dimensional vector space here. All right, just for the sake of, um, well, this comment really. <laughs> so since V is a finite dimensional vector space, you can pick a basis. You can look at the matrices. And so the, basically, the thing is the matrix of the composite is the product of the matrices of the composed transformations. And so the fact that the center of the matrix algebra is lambda times the identity matrix means that the corresponding center of this is lambda times the identity transformation. Is one way to look at it if you're more comfortable with matrix things. I'm sure that there is a purely um, function linear transformation argument as well, but I, I don't know it right offhand. Anyway, so that's that. So once you know that, it's easy to see that this is an R algebra. The homomorphism, right, is what? <laughs> it's just x times the identity map, right, on V. So 
There you go. All right. Let's work a homework problem. You're like, work a homework problem? What's this world coming to? Yes, I think this homework problem is worth working. So um, number eight on page 344, an element of M, an element M of the R module M is called a torsion element if Rm is equal to zero for some non-zero element R in R. So let me, let me erase all this and start at the top. All right, so tor. What is the torsion of M? Torsion of M is equal to M in the module such that what? Such that Rm is equal to zero for some non-zero R in the ring. This is the the torsion of a module, all right? And so this question asks us to prove that the torsion is a submodule. It's called the torsion submodule. And it says, give an example of a ring R in R module such that the torsion, torsion of module is not a submodule. Oh, excuse me. It says there's a condition there. If R is an integral domain, then the torsion is a submodule. So it says, give an example of a ring such that the torsion of M is not a submodule. See, if R has zero divisors, show that every non-zero R module has non-zero torsion elements. All right, so these are A, B, and C. These are some, some tasks to get us a little bit more in tune with this concept of a torsion, the torsion of a module. Okay, so let's, let's do part A. Maybe I should just, look, let's look at an example, actually, before we do anything else. Um, and I always go back to vector spaces because that's, you know, that's my happy place. If I think of M is equal to a vector space, right? And that vector space is over R equals whatever field the vector space is a vector space over, right? So here, the module action scalar multiplication What's the torsion of, of M in this case? So the question is, what vector in a vector space is such that there is some non-zero scalar that you multiply by the vector orthogonal vectors? There's no such thing as an orthogonal scalar, though. Like we're scalar, scalar the R, RM is scalar multiplication. So you, you cannot have a non-zero scalar times a vector be zero yeah. unless that vector is the zero vector. Yeah. So the torsion of M is very small. It's just the set containing the zero vector. Okay? So that actually would fit as an example of part A of this problem because of course, a field is an integral domain, right? But this is the kind of most stupid, one of the stupidest kind of submodules, the, the trivial submodule, right? Here's another example. Let's look at, oh, I don't know, M equal to um, Z mod N. And let's look at the ring being Z mod N again. So that's something you can do. Any ring is a, any ring is an, it's a module over itself, right? Because, you, you know, the, the module addition is just addition of, you know, residue classes. And the uh, module action is just multiplication of residue classes, right? So now the question, so that, now let's think about this one. What's the tor? Of, of Zn here. We'd be looking for, let's say, um, M. Well, I mean, let me not use M because it's too much like N. Let's say X in Zn, right? Such that, you know, for some Y, I'll use A, such that A 
times x is equal to 0, right? For some a, you know, non zero a. Here, let's make it even more specific. What's the torsion of like Z3? Except for zero, right? Yeah. I think that's right. How about the torsion of Z20? Zero's in there. <laughs> oh, so two is in there. And ten is in there, right? Four and four and five. Yeah. Because four times five is. Oh, is it really just prime factorization of, or factors of twenty? You get two ten, four five. I think eight's in there too, right? Because eight times five is forty, which yeah, is. Yeah. I think six is in there too, because six times ten is. Yeah, so let me let me write this list in a little bit more orderly fashion. So what's in the torsion here is zero, two, not three, four, five, six, not seven, eight, not nine, uh, ten, not eleven, twelve, uh, not thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, not seventeen, eighteen. Not 19. There you go. In fact, these are the zero divisors. Yeah. In Z20. And there are no divisors of zero in Z3 because Z3 is Z mod 3 of the field. Right. So the things that are missing are in the groups of units. So I think we could say this, the torsion of Zn looks like, if I'm not mistaking, this would be Z and remove the group of units, you know, in terms of set difference, yeah. All right, so can we prove it's a submodule? Let's prove it. The, prove it's a sub. Can we prove that the the, the, the tor is a submodule? So we can use a submodule test, right? Yeah. First of all, tor of m contains zero, right? Thus, the torsion is not equal to the empty set, right? Now assume R is integral domain. See, that's part of part A. It says assume R is an integral domain. OK? Right, so assume R is an integral domain. And let's try step two in the submodule criteria, right? OK. Let x and y the elements with torsion, which is another way of saying they're an element of torsion of M, right? And let 
let r be an element of r, right? Then there exist m1 and m2 in r such that what? Such that m1 x equals to 0 and m2y is equal to 0, right? By definition of torsion, that's what it means for x and y to be in the torsion is that there's some ring element that when you act on x and when you act on y, you get 0, despite the fact that, what else do we get to say? That m1 and m2 are what? I mean, let me not, let me not leave that out. It's important. Non-zero, right? Non-zero. So what do I need to do? I need to show that x plus ry is in the torsion, right? So we're looking at x plus ry. And we want to show that that's in the torsion. What do we need to do? Um, we have to show that, that, that x plus r y is in the torsion. Yeah, what does it take to show it's in the torsion, right? Um, I would say. Right, but what does it take? I mean, I, I think we can do this directly. We want to show that x plus r y is in the torsion, right? That means we have to find a ring element, right, which yeah. is called r up there, such that bad. Okay, so and not you can't use r obviously, but find a ring element. Let's say s, right, such that say s times this is zero. Okay. So what should we make s equal to to make that zero? That's the one thing that's not allowed. So. Observe. I'll get us started. Oh, but you if, can choose anything because that thing times x is zero plus o. Well, not just anything times x is zero. Oh, yeah. That thing. Yeah. Oh, 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 so how about m1? Yeah. Well, that's lovely because that makes this go away, right? Or this makes the other one go away. Right? Yeah. So. Oh, m1, m2. Aha, uh -huh. yeah, there we go. Now, how do you know that that's non zero? Now, we know that m1 is non-zero. We know that m2 is non-zero. How do we know that m1 times m2 is non-zero? No, no, that, that, no, no, no. That's where this being an integral domain comes into play. Integral domains are commutative rings with identity that have no zero divisors. If the product of this was zero, that would contradict it being an integral domain. Since r is an integral domain, that's non-zero. And as you pointed out, that gives me <coughs> commutative, right? So m2, m1x plus r, um, m1, m2y, right? And that, and that, 0, 0, we get 0. Therefore, x plus ry is in the torsion. So thus, by the submodule, um, test, <clears throat> we have proved that the torsion is indeed a submodule in this context. All right. And yet, the torsion, when we're outside of this context, it's not a submodule. Right? Like, is Zn minus Un a submodule? I don't think it is because. If you look at this, right, is this closed under addition? Um, no, 4 plus 5 is 9, yeah. right? You can take the addition of zero divisors and get units. It's a funny thing, right? And this, even in linear algebra, right, if you add together invertible matrices, is there some invertible? You should be like, I have no earthly idea because the, the concept of invertibility is a, con is a multiplicative concept, which doesn't interface that directly with multiplication. So, but anyway, um, so that's part A of problem eight. Um, so part B, 
was give an example of a ring R and an R, R module M such that torsion of M is not a submodule. I think we did it here, right here. Right? This is the example for part B. Part C, if R has zero divisors, show that every non-zero R module has non-zero torsion elements. Let's think through that for a second, yeah? So if R has zero divisors, yeah, it would not be an integral domain, that's true. So. R has zero divisors. Then what does it say? Then every non-zero R module has non-zero torsion. Then every non-zero R module M has torsion of M um, not equal to just zero. I mean, it's got more than just zero in it. And it says, what did it say? It says that, uh, well, it just says it has non-zero torsion elements. So can we, can we prove that? So if, if R has zero divisors, that means that there exists, let's say, A and B in R such that A not equal to zero, B not equal to zero, yet A, B equal to zero, right? So let X be an element of M. How do I know such a thing exists? X is non-zero. Well, it's a non-zero module, right? So there's at least one point in the module that's non-zero X. Then AX is in M, right? Because it's the definition of module action, act by the ring, still on there. And BAX is equal to zero, thus AX is an element of the torsion M. So torsion will contain, at least it will contain multiples of zero divisors. Now in my experience working with you know, a calculus and such, I have seen that all of the nasty stuff comes from zero divisors times whatever. So this is, this kind of tells me like this torsion idea is somewhat in tune with capturing weirdness, <laughs> right? This, this torsion, it's not that interesting. Uh, no, no, the torsion in physics is um, zero for um, general relativity. At least it's possible to find a torsionless metric. You can always choose, like the levi civita connection, I think, gives you zero torsion. But in contrast, the torsion, even in flat superspace, is non-zero because of the anti-commuting coordinates. But that's a different kind of torsion. But different, but yet not, because it, it does, the vanishing of torsion kind of speaks to some sort of uh, lack of exoticness, if you will. Uh, it's the usual thing, the torsion being zero, you know? Um, well, from my perspective, but I, I guess from another person's perspective, who works on things with torsion, you'd be like, well, no, torsion being non-zero is, is the usual thing, right? All right, so ne next up, moving along here. This will come back. This is a major part of the story in chapter 12. That's why I want to seed your intuition for it now. So next up, he talks about 
our module homomorphisms. What, is it, what does it mean to have a homomorphism of our modules? What do you think? So if you have, yeah? Sorry. Yes. Well, they had the tires. What? They told me they had them. Well, can they get cheaper ones for tomorrow then? Okay. Yep. I'm sorry, dear. All right, well, call me back when you know more. Six eighty. Uh, we got to go to that service road thing. I'll let you. I'll let you drive. Can I go from behind the building? I, as far as I know, no. But I haven't tried, so I don't know for sure. But. No. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you back out. Right, bye bye. Well, that is. I called them to ask if they had tires. She went over there. They don't have any tires. What, 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 what? <clears throat> anyway, M and M R modules. Sorry about that. <sighs> M and M R modules. So, what does it mean for these to be R module isomorphic or homomorphic? So, what does that mean? What is an R module homomorphism? It's the mapping F, right? Yeah. That goes from M to N and it preserves the R module structure, right? So that means, first of all, it's additive. It's a, it's a homomorphism. It's a homomorphism of the, the additive group structures of M and M. In other words, F of, um, F of X plus Y equals F of X plus F of Y. That's the one thing, right? And also, F of R times X is equal to R times F of X. Notice, though, to be clear, that this is the module action of R in M, whereas this is the module action of R in N. Okay. And in principle, those those could be quite quite different, right? So. Does it fix things in the ring? Does it fix things in the ring? I don't know if that even makes sense to, to operate on the ring because it, it acts on things in the module. So R is in the ring. R is not a subset. Generally speaking, R is not a subset of M, typically. We have worked with examples yeah. where R is either a subset of M or it's, it's an isomorphic subset of R. There's a subset of M which is isomorphic to R. But that doesn't have to be the case. Okay. So that doesn't make sense to ask that question. It's a good question that you've asked, but it's no, we can't we can't say whether or not R is fixed. But what we can say is that in the context of a vector space being a field module, right? Mm -hmm. That the definition of R module homomorphism just becomes linear transformation. Yeah. Right? And um, so then we can talk about other things, like what would isomorphism mean? What would an isomorphism of R modules be? That would be 